everybody singing with her. This is That must be the scripture reading for today. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It's so beautiful. This is my story. This is my story. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. You know, the Father is raising up a generation, a young generation, that is going to have a, a passion for hymns that have been long forgotten. Yes, yes, that's it. Thank you, Lord. Because the scripture says that I will return the hearts of the children to the parents and the hearts of the parents to the children. There is a time that a young generation is going to enter into an anointing with old hymns and during that time, when the young generation is up here drumming and singing what they relate to, there's going to be an old generation dancing through the aisles and say, this ain't no hymn, but I can't stop myself from dancing. God is bringing his family together. Yes. He's bringing his family together. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So we don't have too much time today, so we're going to get right to it. Since January, we have been going through the Old Testament, one book after another after another, to reveal the mystery of Jesus in the Word of God and to help God's sons and daughters understand we are the generation where there is a war against the Word of God. There is a war against what God established in the Garden of Eden. And the kingdom of darkness is very well aware that there was an amazing miracle that took place on the third day. The kingdom of darkness realized that when you put seed in the earth, Every seed will multiply after its own kind. You would think it's a simple concept, and it really is. In fact, there's a scripture that says that when a farmer plants, the farmer goes to sleep and does not know how it all works. But suddenly, during the harvest, the farmer harvests a crop because God sends the rain and the sun and then whatever you sow, you reap. Because of this, at this time, the kingdom of darkness is doing everything to destroy the multiplication of the seed. For some strange reason, the church often judges people and is unaware that unless you are growing your own food at home, you are eating food 
that is transgendered and cannot produce seed after its own kind. You are eating food that cannot reproduce itself. This is why Jesus said, don't be judging your brother when you have a log in your own eye. Some of these things we can't do anything about. We can't all be farmers. But God is saying, that's why you need me. That's why you need me. You can't change the world that you live in. But this is why you need me. So, yeah. Every time you're spraying those dandelions, you're actually helping the kingdom of darkness destroy the reproduction of seed. And the spray you spray it with will give you cancer. And you actually don't know that if you ate the dandelion, it'll actually kill cancer cells in your body. So you want your lawn to look beautiful, so you spray cancerous things that give you cancer when God has given you a lawn full of remedy for the cancer. I don't know where we're going. This has nothing to do with what we're speaking today, but it's just, it's, it costs the same. It's extra. Extra. It's kind of like Happy Meal with an extra, you know, fry on the side. Don't cost you anything. It's, it's supersize it, Lord. Supersize it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. By the way, for anyone who's here wondering what time is the service going to start, um, <laughs> the service actually already ended, so we're, we're <laughs> praise the Lord. So yes, we've been going through scripture, and there is a war against the word of God, and um, by now, I am happy that many have come to me afterwards and said, oh my God, I had no idea that the Bible was so amazing. And I am actually getting ahead of you, Rabbi, because I'm already in the book of Judges. I'm already past, I'm already in, 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 in past Joshua. I, gotta, I don't have time to wait for what revelation Rabbi is going to give us on Sunday. I got to try to eat this for myself. I got to see if I can figure something out. And this is what the Father said. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. So you're actually eating the one thing that's going to keep you through the time of trial that is coming to this world. So we've been speaking a lot about Joshua because we're in the book of Joshua. And sometimes, as it is often said, uh, Messiah says, I reveal the end from the beginning. Who remembers the first word in the Bible? Bereshit. Bereshit. For those of you who are entrepreneurs, I just thought of this. I, I, can't, I can't claim it because it's God's word, but if you could just write Bereshit and then just have a little bear going to the bathroom afterwards. <laughs> It'll keep people thinking. What does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> Look it up. Google it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Michael. <laughs> or you could just have the beard. The people who know will say, Hallelujah. <laughs> I know what that means. <laughs> Thank you, Father. So in the book of Joshua, Joshua is amazing. We spoke last week about how important it is to understand that Moses could not bring the children of Israel into the promised land because if he did, it would mean that we can keep these laws and earn the kingdom by our actions. God never wanted us to earn anything by our actions. For this reason, the scripture says there are none good, not one, but God. The scripture also says, if any man says, I have not sinned, that man is a liar. I think it's interesting it says men it doesn't say women so i guess the women are okay <laughs> praise the lord sisters <laughs> hallelujah praise the lord 
Praise the Lord. So it's amazing. So, 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 so God wanted us to understand in a story that took place 1,300 years before Jesus came that only Joshua, in Hebrew, Yahoshua, that is the Hebrew name for Joshua, and in Aramaic, that name is shifted to Yeshua. It's a little abbreviated. Yeshua is the name of Jesus in Aramaic. So God in this story is simply saying this. In order for you to enter into the promised land, it's only possible through Yeshua, through Jesus. Nobody can earn their way into the promised land because the promised land was divided by the wilderness with a river called the River Jordan. And the crossing of the Jordan means you have to be rebirthed in order to enter the promised land. So you could not jump over the, prom, the, the river to get into the promised land. You couldn't build a bridge to get there. There was no way in there. You had to go through the Jordan. And by the way, the Jordan was one of the most filthiest, dirtiest rivers in the land before you entered into the promised land. It's for this reason that many years later, a man named Naaman had leprosy, and when he came to the prophet Elisha to find out how he could be healed, Elisha said, just go in the Jordan and seven times, and he said, are you kidding me? Where I come from, there's clean water, beautiful rivers. I will not go into that filthy river. And a little servant, a little Jewish girl said to him, you came all the way this way. What do you have to lose? Just try it. And it went in once, nothing happened, twice, nothing, three, four, five, six, nothing. Just for poops and giggles, <laughs> he went the seventh time, and when he came out, it says that his skin was as pure as a child, as a babe. Dirty river. God is saying, no matter who you think you are, you cannot enter the promised land until there is a rebirthing. And the rebirthing, it's actually not you being born again. It's Yeshua being born in you. That revelation alone has set so many people free because if you think you're born again, two days later when you screw up, then you're disappointed. It's not you being born again. You're the earthen vessel, and Jesus, who is the incorruptible seed, is birthed in you. So even though you still have dirt, the seed actually needs the dirt to grow. Amen. So you screw it up, and it says, Lord, I hope you can use that dirt. I hope you can use that dirt. <laughs> And the only time that the Lord no longer needs the dirt is when the seed has now matured and it's time for the harvest. And when you harvest it, that seed does not need dirt anymore because it's been made mature. Isn't that beautiful? Come on, somebody. Yeah. Hallelujah. So God is saying the only way you can enter into the promised land is under the leadership of Yeshua. Joshua, Jesus. And so we begin to see that there's amazing correlations and connections between Jesus and Joshua. Some that you could never see unless, unless you go deep into the Old Testament and says, what does this mean? Because some of these things are so bizarre. You may recall, we've actually spoke a little bit about this, how when Joshua was going in a battle, before they even went into the promised land, it says that, 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 that Moses was up on the hill, and he had a stick. Oh, I think I need, I, I think I know who might have a stick. Come on. Thank you. Thank you. It says that Moses went up on the hill, and he had a stick. And whenever he put his hands up, it says that Joshua advanced and had victory. And when Moses was tired and his hands came down, he lost and he came back. You see, stick, hands high. On a hill far away stood an old... Stick, hands, come on, hands on a stick up high. 
What do you think that represents? It says that, that what Jesus is doing on Calvary is the victory of Jesus for the people. His death is our victory. His death is our victory. His death is our victory. There's so many things about Joshua that is a representation of Jesus. The very fact that he brings the people around the city of Jericho and they go around seven times and all of a sudden they take the shofar and they sound it on the seventh day as they go around. And the Lord said, you are not going to have to fight. All you have to do is go around the city and then sound the shofar and the walls that were built by giants will come tumbling down. So they went around the city seven times, and they sounded the shofar. Yeah. <laughs> tumbling down. Why is this so significant? Because in the New Testament, it speaks that we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the tinkling of an eye, not in the tinkling, in the twinkling of an eye, <laughs> on the last trumpet, the last shofar. It says that the Lord shall come down with the sound of the shofar. Can I tell you what was happening 1,300 years before Jesus came into the world was a foreshadow of this generation because we're the generation that is dancing around everything that is against God in the name of the Lord. And the Lord has provided a shofar for these walls, these walls of, 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 of religious, these walls of, of political, these walls of, 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 of finances, Man-made religion, man-made politics, and man-made finances are crumbling down because we're not going to listen to the ways of this world. We're going to listen to the ways of our God and to His Word, and we're going to have a shofar to sound, and these walls must come down. Yeah. 1,300 years before Jesus came. The children of Israel are experiencing what this generation is going to experience in this age. <laughs> what an amazing thing. All this God is revealing through the book of Joshua and through, and, through, and through these things. There is something else about Joshua that is so profound and you have to actually go back a little bit. And I think it's actually, um, I think it's in Numbers 13, verse 6. Uh, if, if, can you please come up? It's the second reading I had up there. <clears throat> Again, that's Numbers chapter 13, verse 16. Now, this, this, is, this is really important because in, in order to know a person, sometimes you have to know where the person came from. Amen? You got to know where the person came from. This is why in the scripture there's genealogies because you need to know where did they come from. There's something about the genealogy that's very, very important. So here we go. These are the names of the men Moses sent to investigate the land. Now he gave Joshua, son of Nun, the name Joshua. So Joshua's name originally was Joshua. Hasha simply means salvation. And Moses said, salvation is not enough. I have to add to your name. I have to say, Yeshua or Yehoshua. Yeho means God saves. You see, he was named salvation, but, God, but Moses is saying salvation is not sufficient. You need to know that salvation comes from God. So Joshua's original name was just salvation, and it was changed to Yeshua or Yehoshua. Are you following me? Where are you going? Come on, we're not done. <laughs> All right? So, so these are the names of... So this is the first time that they went... This was 40 years earlier when they went into the check out the promised land when they had 12, uh, 12 uh, spies to go check out the land. And this is what it's spoken. Again, uh, the per, part in per, parentheses. Now, now he gave... Now he gave Joshua, son of Nun, the name 
Joshua. Joshua, you may be seated. You. You're like, I already read that. Okay, so he was the son of? Mm-hmm. He was the son of? Oh, so wait, come on, put it up there still. They, they, they'll, they'll forget it if it's not up there. He was the son of? None. Now, I know that the U makes it sound like a, uh, but nuns wouldn't have any because not. No. <laughs> Nun. <laughs> Nuns are not supposed to have children, right? I mean, so, so, right, so it couldn't be the son of a nun. It had to be the son of Nun. Nun. In, in Hebrew, that is N uh, uh, O O N in the sound. He was the son of Nun. Now, you know in the Bible, when someone is the son of someone, it says, and he something someone else. He begat, begat, and he begat, which means that Nun. Beget Hashua, who was changed to Joshua, which in Aramaic is Yeshua, which in English is Jesus. So Nun beget a foreshadow of Jesus, who brings the people into the. Are you following me? Nun, Nun. Beget. Now, the word beget in Hebrew means that, that Joshua came out of Nun. Joshua came out of Nun. Joshua came out of Nun. Because Nun beget Joshua. In Aramaic, the word Nun is fish, which means 1,300 years ago, before, actually uh, 3,300 years, because we're 2,000 years after this, okay? It says that noon fish beget Joshua. <laughs> it means that Jesus came out from the fish. Why is that so important? Why is that so important? Because many years later, there was someone named Jonah. And Jonah came out of the fish. And let us go to the New Testament and see how Jonah is connected to Jesus, who is connected to Joshua, who came from noon, who is a fish. Matthew 12, 40. For just as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. You may be seated. Can you see it? I tell you what, if you don't see, you have to take a doggy bag and eat this at home because sometimes you're like, what the heck just happened here? How is Joshua connected to Jesus? And how is Jesus connected to Jonah? God is saying my whole word is a code within a code, within a code, within a code. And the beautiful thing is that he's taking his word within a code, within a code, and place it in your heart and in your mind. The code is coming into you so that you become connected to all these things. Which means if Jesus is compared to Jonah who came out of the mouth of the fish. Now you understand why Christians have a symbol of a fish because it means that we are all coming from the mouth of a fish. Why would God say that? Because at one point in time, the disciples needed a treasure to pay some bills and Jesus said, go find me a fish because in the fish there is a treasure. You are the refined fire, the refined gold by the fire that is stuck in the belly of a fish and God is about to bring you out in this generation to a land where all around us we're surrounded by Nineveh people who hate God and God is saying I'm drawing out of the fish's mouth as a treasure so that you can manifest my glory in the land of the lost and you're the one called to do it (laughs) hallelujah 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that brings me to the introduction of today's message. <laughs> you see, you see, some eight or so years ago, my family and I were traveling across the Connecticut, uh, Long Island Sound. We were traveling through there, and, and uh, I'll tell you the truth. It was easier to travel to Haiti than to come into Connecticut. I said, Lord, the one place I will never go to is Connecticut. <laughs> No way, no way. So at the time we had um, Olive Tav, our, our vessel, um, and I just wanted to get out of Connecticut waters as fast as I could because in many ways I am very much like the Jonah. If God would have said you have to go to Connecticut, I says, oh no, I'm sailing down to Haiti before I go to Connecticut. But God in his mercy waited some eight years and now planted my behind and my family in Connecticut. And there is a, a movement of some congregations who's going around anointing all the borders of the state of Connecticut. And they needed someone to anoint the coastline and someone had the bright idea, I think, I think in the spirit, that crazy rabbi from Litchfield is supposed to do the coastline. So... Herein, I have been asked, what are you going to name the boat? I think a proper name for it should be Bereshit. Yes. So, here's the situation. I have been traveling. I actually have two witnesses who come with me. They drop me off. I started in Westerly and to cross the Connecticut line. And, I've been, and, I, and I have a trail. I don't have it in here because it would make a mess in here. I have a trail. You remember the little ribbons you got, the little ribbons that are a representation of, of the one who comes through the womb first? I have 50 ribbons like that soaked in anointing oil, and I trail it behind the, the tiller here, and, and I leave a little streak of oil, but it's, but it's holy oil, so don't, all you environmentalists, don't get all wacky on me. It's anointing oil. It's olive oil that we pray over, and there's a trickle coming. We've done it for two days. We're about one-third of the way, and it takes a little longer than I thought because in a small boat, it's, it's a little harder than when I had my yacht. I, I should have done it when I had my yacht because it would have been so much easier to just keep dumping oil in the back of it. But God sometimes says, if you don't do it when it's easy, you're going to have to do it when it's hard. <laughs> so... Here's the thing. This is not something. This is our story. You know, as it was saying this morning, this is my story. When we say this is my story, the Father hears all of us saying this is my story. So it's our story. So today, after the time that we do the love offering, um, the, the, the deacons are going to provide you with some markers. And I just want you to come and write whatever message you want on this little vest. It could be, it could be a verse from Scripture. It could be just sign your name. It says, hey, I, just, I want to be part of this with my own name. Whatever the Spirit of the Lord leads you to write on this little vessel, this is what you're going to write. By the way, the starboard side, which is the right side, but boats don't have right sides. They have starboard sides. And people get mad. And he says, why is that? It's because when you say go to the right, everyone in the boat would say, who's right? <laughs> So boats have starboard sides. So the starboard side, this side is the whole side who's actually going across the Connecticut, the Connecticut coastline. Yeah, yeah. And then the winds and the wave bring the anointing oil so that the whole entire coastline of Connecticut will be anointed. Our goal is to complete this before the Day of Atonement, which is coming next week. Because this is our story. Thank you, Father. Thank you.
feel like today I have a whole bunch of people with me on this little berry sheet vessel. Had a great time yesterday seeing all the people coming out and riding on, on it and uh, it's so neat. I'm sitting over here and I have all kinds of reading material.